Okay. Um, okay, now the recording started, so if you want to. All right, I'll take two. Uh, we will now uh, call the November uh, RAC meeting to order. And John, please call the roll. Sure. Uh, Mike Leibowitz? Here. Mahalia Fernando? Here. Cole Stout? Here. Uh, Jose Del Cid? Not here yet. Uh, Lucas Habaski won't be here. Brian Meyer? Here. Dina Passman? Here. Pat Sheehan? Not here yet. And Laval, uh, excuse me, Laval Walls said he had a conflict. Uh, Emma Wormser. Here. All right. You have a quorum. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we we'll go down the agenda. And before we get to our uh, special guests and our uh, conversations, uh, public comment. John, is there anybody from the public that wants to speak? Uh, I don't know. We do have a couple uh, unfamiliar names on. Uh, folks, guests who are joining us, if you want to provide comments, um, either at the start of the meeting or later on, please just uh, raise your hand and we can recognize you. All right. Uh, hi, uh, my name is John McCaffrey. I'm representing a uh, crosswalk student organization. That's a school, or, school organization. Basically, we do non-car dependency and we represent the Bethesda Chevy Chase High School community in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, so later on, when you guys get a chance, I want to provide my two-minute testimonies uh, about the J2 and uh, the changes that I think need to be made, as well as other students in the call who also believe as strongly as I do. Uh, this is the time for that. So, go if ahead. You wouldn't, if you, yeah, go ahead. If you wouldn't mind turning your camera on, so we can. All right. Um, not not everybody's in here just yet, but I'd I'd, I'd love to get started. Um, so again, my name is John McCaffrey. I'm a senior at BCC, um, Bethesda Chevy Chase High School in Bethesda, Maryland. So uh, I think the Maryland representative that is. Holly Fernando as well. I'm really coming at you as well as the, at large. So a lot of BCC students take the J2 to school every day, um, principally from like starting right like 6.57 a.m. all the way up until school starting at 7.45 and then back home when school gets out at 2.30. And so one of the biggest issues I'm seeing is these buses, like we still have the single, we have the single um, length buses. They get so crowded after um before school and after school that me and many other people will literally just get past with a bus full bus full and there'll be kids waiting to come home from school especially that literally will be passed by three different j2s and we'll be waiting there for 40 plus minutes um i think that's unacceptable and i think one thing that we can do that would not be we would just need um um our articulated higher capacity buses from 7 to 8 a.m um that's the time they should leave Silver Spring Station. So buses leaving Silver Spring Station from 7 to 8 a.m. towards Montgomery Mall should be higher capacity to um, not only BCC students, but there's also a lot of people who come into work who um, it's, it's time so crowded, like people don't even have room to stand, let alone sit. And so the same thing applies, I think, coming from Montgomery Mall Transit Center back towards Silver Spring, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. is reasonable as well. Um, I think that would cover most of the demand and i think trust me everybody hundreds of kids are here in spirit with us because uh we gotta make change it's got change and i'm i'm hopefully the voice as many people as possible john thank you so much for that um i was actually listening to you when i was typing i was actually typing up all your notes um so what i intend to do and i'll talk to the board uh, to the rest of the rack on this um but I'd like to uh, raise exactly the issue because uh, what we do is for the RAC is we have a monthly um, part of the agenda at the WMATA board where I can speak directly to the board and the general manager and everything like that. And what I'd like to do is um, is um, really just relay everything you just said on your behalf and on all the other students' behalf um, and propose your recommendations and also put it in writing so it's out there so that they kind of have to answer to it and then hold their feet to the fire um, so that's that's what I would intend to do. Um, I'll open up to the rest of the rack in case anybody else has any questions or comments for you. But um, this is the stuff that we're here for and really appreciate it. And this is definitely that's why I was taking 
frantic notes as you were talking. I was taking make quotes and everything like that, so that I can really, um, you know, express what you're saying along with your recommendations. So thank you. Does anybody else want to uh, thank you. say anything? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else in the rack, or are we all are we all good? I'd like to just um, I just want to give these students kudos for articulating the issue and coming to this forum in order to um, advocate for a need in the system that severely impacts your ability to access education. So keep doing what you're doing. I mean, we're the place where you should bring these things up. So thank you so much for sharing. Brian, did you have something? Nope, I'm good. I was just okay. echoing what uh, you and Dina said. Great. And if I, I just want to make sure I, I typed the right notes, John. Um, you said that your recommendation is um, higher capacity buses um, kind of to and from Montgomery Mall Transit Center and Silver Spring um, between 7 8, and 8 a.m. as well as 2 to 4 p.m. kind of going in the obviously the appropriate direction. Yeah. Is that right? No, I think the appropriate direction is necessary because coming from Montgomery Mall to Silver Spring, usually the J2, it's needed that the service we have right now, but usually not super full buses but i think mm -hmm. the buses because people are going from silver spring like the lower income areas like summit hills um barrington paddington all those apartment complexes they're going to the jobs in bethesda the jobs in montgomery mall and so let alone the students who are also coming to the same places and so i think that directionality emphasis is very important yes okay um perfect and i i made a quote in there um hundreds of kids are here in spirit with us and i will i'm going to use that um, so thank very you. True. Very true, yeah. Okay. Um, anything else? Any other public comments um, besides John? Hearing and seeing nothing. Um, again, thank you, John, for that comment. It will definitely, the meeting for the WMATA board is on November 16th, and I am going to uh, definitely bring that up and put it in writing for you. Um, and I think we have a, te a text in here. Can... Yeah, yeah, that's another member of my organization. His name is Ollie. Um, he's on his mom's account, but he's basically echoing the same thing I said. Okay, it was. I'm just going to read into the record here. I'm with Crosswalks as well, and the only reason I don't take the bus is because the one time I did wait for it, it was so full there was no space for me to get on, even when I wanted for the next bus to arrive. I'm old, I need glasses. It was still so packed, I had to wiggle out of the way in order for people to get to the exits. Okay, yeah, um, that that's perfect. Um, thank you, um, Ali, John, and um, everybody else. Is there any okay. other uh, statements or comments? Oh, yeah, go ahead, John. If I could just say, um, John, I'm putting my email, I'm the staff um, for the group, so I actually work for Metro. Um, the rest of these folks, uh, our volunteers. I just put my email in the chat. If you could just drop me a line, because I don't know, I, I I won't have any way to follow up with you. Um, so uh, if you could do that within the next few days, and as we sort of move this through the process, that'll just allow me to to keep tabs in it and keep you updated. Yeah, totally, totally. I'd I'd be happy to. Thank you, thank you for giving me that line of communication. Sure thing. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, any other public comment? I think we, we're we good, right? Okay, so that was great. Um, really, this is stuff that I think this is what the RAC's here for, so I'm really happy that we had that comment and hopefully we can, um, you know, use our, our platform to assist uh, J2 riders, particularly the students. Um, okay, moving on to the next agenda item is fiscal year 2025 budget. And um, so we have uh, Mark Irvine and Alex Block um, from Metro who are going to give us this presentation. So I just want to add that or state that I watched at least a version of this presentation at the board meeting last, I think it was last week. Um, and it is very informative and it's also very uh, con uh, concerning from a writer point of view. Uh, I think this is something that we can definitely use um, the information in it as we contemplate our own writer engagement efforts and endeavors, which um, we should talk about immediately after this presentation. So on that note, uh, Mark and Alex, uh, the floor is yours. And thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for having us. My name is Mark Irvin, Director of Strategy and Policy, and joined by 
So you mentioned Alex Block, who's manager and strategy and policy team. And we're just going to go through go through this presentation and then look forward to feedback and conversation. So we make this as discussion oriented as, as everyone would like. Um, we'll start with this quick overview that I'm going to actually turn it over to, to Alex. And this is meant to encapsulate where, where we are and what's contained in the rest of the presentation. So you know, three main, three main points. Metro's service improvements and fair policies we believe are working. So ridership and customer satisfaction has been going up. The trend is good. We've made a lot of um, service changes and also fare changes and introduced some new products like the, the Metro Lift reduced fare program for people enrolled in SNAP. Um, but looking ahead at FY25, that's where things get really difficult and challenging from a budget perspective. And we're, at, we're actually simultaneously having to plan for really two levels of scenarios. One we're calling a real severe scenario of, of severe cuts, and that's you know facing basically the full the full budget gap without any additional funding, funding and resources. And then there's another scenario um, where we're also looking at more more targeted service changes or service service cuts and fair and fair changes. And so we'll talk about um, what those are. But I think this is especially good opportunity to get feedback and input from your group because on the severe cuts. I don't think anyone thinks that those are are certainly not good, and, but not even necessarily acceptable in, by any measure. Um, the idea of the, the targeted cuts is not that you know those cuts are things that would improve the system or make things better for customers, but if, if we were in a position of forced to do some service cuts or reductions, what is the way to figure out what would be the least impactful um, cuts that we could do so the least bad so so input from that perspective would be would be helpful um, and then we have a section that we're not going to go through it entirely today but it's included in the appendix so available for anybody is talking about the the capital investment program where that's been a source of big investment in the region and we've been, um, really ramped ramped that up made a lot of progress in terms of state of good repair but looking ahead and in this Next year's budget, we're going to approve the next six-year capital program. Um, the, we're in a place where it's really starting to be financially financially constrained, and looking at a smaller capital program than we've had had in the past, which puts some investments at risk and really forces some hard hard trade-offs. And there's a number of number of factors there. I mean, one of them is inflation has like the the, the funding sources are generally not indexed to inflation. We've had a lot of inflation. Especially in the last the last couple of years, and so that's eroded the the value of the money essentially, or the spending power of of the money, quite quite a bit. And I'll turn it over to Alex, who's going to go through. But then we're looking forward to, to discussing. All right, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, for anybody who had a chance to uh, uh, listen in on the the board meeting last week, this is a very long presentation with a lot of slides. So I'm going to try to go through fairly fast. Uh, so we can have as much time for discussion. Um, just to start off from the top, uh, uh, all of our, our fair and service uh, decisions, we want to be informed by our strategic uh, transformation plan, which lays out these four goals for Metro as a whole. It also contains a number of different metrics around service frequency, crowding, ridership, and things of that nature um, that all uh, stem uh, from the overall uh, uh, strategy for the authority. In the recent years, we've made a number of changes to both rail and bus service uh, to adapt to how uh, customers are changing their travel patterns. Um, so this is an example where we have shifted both rail and bus to provide more frequent service all day and throughout the entire week. Uh, the, the graphic shows uh, how we are uh, shifting our resources to deploy more trains and buses in service during off peak periods on weekends and during late night periods that hopefully better meets um, customers needs. For the bus network overall, uh, uh, how this uh, might appear is, is with the emergence of the frequent service network in the past few years where we have a total of 37 lines offering frequent service all day. 
And we've started to see some uh, uh, good results from that overall. Our bus ridership is at 90% of pre-pandemic levels and more uh, than pre-pandemic levels on weekends. Part of this restructuring involved discontinuing a lot of our lower performing, higher cost service. So we've been able to both uh, restructure the network to grow ridership and gain efficiency uh, by eliminating some of those lower productivity bus routes. On the rail side, uh, just uh, recently with the FY24 budget, uh, we have an example here of realigning the green and yellow line service uh, to offer more frequent service all day throughout the quarter. Uh, so far, we've only partially implemented this service because of our ongoing rail car shortage with the 7000 series issues. Uh, but even so, we're still seeing very positive results with uh, um, on an average day, uh, or not average day, but some of the strong ridership days that we had last week, for example, 37% um, of our uh, customers are using the yellow or the green lines. That translates to about 160,000 trips on, on any uh, of those very busy uh, midweek days. On the fair side, we have made a number of different investments uh, in both technology and adjusting our fare policy. Um, in FY21, we launched the mobile smart trip uh, uh, ability to pay with uh, uh, iPhones and Android phones. And over the following years, we've introduced a number of different fare policy changes from weekend and late night flat fares at $2, the rail bus transfer, some decreased prices for passes, and then most recently in FY24, we had a, a very uh, significant restructuring of our overall fare system uh, to align the rail and bus space fares. We capped Metro access fares at $4. Uh, we eliminated the difference between peak and off peak fares and also implemented uh, a low income reduced fare program. Uh, that program, which we call Metro Lift, launched in June of this year. Um, we've seen a, a very impressive uh, uh, uptick in use already. Uh, there are this slide is now a little bit out of date. I believe we're we're more like 140,000 trips taken today. Uh, we have seen uh, the uh, applicants of this system use it at all 98 rail stations and on 150 of our bus routes uh, all across the region. Um, interestingly, uh, you know, the busiest bus route for Metro Lyft customers is the 28A, the Leesburg Pike route in Virginia. Um, but we're seeing use across the entire region um, and it's uh, uh, continuing to grow overall. For the system as a whole, we are seeing ridership grow on both rail and bus and continue to grow as it has over the past few years. Um, the trajectory continues upward and we're seeing um, in general more robust ridership recovery on weekends rather than on weekdays, which uh, uh, matches some of the reallocation of resources uh, that we talked about earlier. We've also made some investments to reduce fare evasion and address a, uh, a common complaint and customer concern. On uh, the investment side, uh, we've uh, in the process of retrofitting fare gates with higher barriers. That has shown uh, demonstrably that it can reduce fare evasion by about 70%. Uh, and hopefully the rest of the stations will be uh, uh, retrofitted uh, by summer 2024. We've also restarted fare enforcement and we have the uh, Metro Lyft low income fare program as well. As we are seeing riders return to the rail and bus systems, we're noticing our buses are starting to get a lot more crowded. Um, overall bus crowding uh, uh, is increasing as it has over the as ridership increases overall. And uh, what that means for customers in practical terms is that it's more and more likely on some of these crowded routes that customers are experiencing uncomfortable conditions and may be passed up at a bus stop and unable to board. Um, the crowding is both a combination of our overall growth and ridership, but it's also a factor um, in some of our difficult conditions on the streets uh, where we have uh, buses navigating through congestion and uh, that slows down their overall service makes them less efficient uh, and that can add to the uh, challenge of crowding. For both rail and bus, we have noticed that uh, as overall ridership continues to grow, federal employees have been slower to return to the system. 
Um, uh, we look at this based on uh, smart benefits use. Um, whereas before the pandemic, federal riders took approximately 12% of trips and they are now taking about 6% of trips overall. And if you were to average that out, that's about 92,000 fewer uh, trips on the system on an average weekday. So that brings us to the FY25 budget. And as Mark mentioned, we have um, sort of two different tracks to discuss with uh, uh, service and fares. One is the path of looking at severe service cuts that will enable us to fully close the budget gap uh, or a package of targeted service uh, uh, efficiencies uh, with some incremental cuts and fare changes that can reduce the size of our budget gap, but it cannot close it all the way. Uh, Metro is also doing a number of other things uh, to look at how we can help reduce the deficit with financial management, trying to find out internal efficiencies uh, and how we can account for preventative maintenance, shifting some of our resources from our capital program to our operating budget. But the discussion today is going to focus on the top two categories of, of fares and service and uh, what kind of policy decisions the board could make to uh, to uh, uh, set that plan for the FY25 budget. Part of the challenge with uh, adjusting or, or trying to close a budget gap with uh, uh, service cuts is that a severe uh, budget cut really reduces our capacity to operate and maintain a quality system. And this is due to the nature of our cost structure, that many of our costs are driven by the footprint of our system and the quality of service that we provide. Uh, so we have lots of work that goes on on a daily basis that does not vary with the amount of service we provide or the number of buses or, or trains that are in service. And so making changes to those uh, staffing levels will have impacts for what customers see on a daily basis. Uh, for example, if you were to reduce the number of the station cleaners or vehicle cleaners, you would see uh, dirtier trains stations. If you were to reduce the number of elevator and escalator mechanics, we would expect to see a large increase in the number of breakdowns and, and uh, elevators that are out of service. If you reduce the number of communications staffers, we would have less ability to get um, updates out to customers about upcoming track work or service disruptions. And because of the nature of those fixed costs means that we cannot close the budget gap uh, with service cuts alone. Um, on the rail side in particular, most of the costs do not vary with service levels. Uh, only 22% uh, approximately are the kinds of costs that, that vary with service. So in order to actually close the large budget gap that we have with severe service cuts, it requires something more than just tweaking the uh, 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 amount of service we provide. It really requires us to think about how we would go about shrinking the size of the system and shrinking both the quality and the footprint of that service that we offer that I mentioned a few slides ago. Uh, I want to emphasize that the concepts shown here are uh, just just that they are concepts. This is not a proposal or a recommendation, but it is illustrative of the kind of rail and bus service cuts that would be required to close the gap without additional regional investment. So the way we would go about trying to shrink the scope of, of the system, the size of the system would involve things like closing the entire rail system at 9 p.m., uh, really reducing headways to every 20 to 30 minutes, implementing all sorts of service changes and turnbacks, closing stations, uh, and even shrinking the number of trains that we have in service to the point where we have fewer rail cars to maintain and that we're able to close uh, some rail yards. On the bus side, it would mean really cutting uh, lots of routes. Uh, there's a trade-off to be made of, of whether we would uh, opt to try to maintain um, service on, say, the 37 lines of the frequent service network while cutting everything else, or potentially maintaining more routes, but reducing service for the routes that remain across the board. Um, there's also different patterns that we could uh, 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 look at, such as truncating all bus routes that have a possible rail connection. 
um, in order to also shrink the size of the bus fleet uh, so that we would be able to close some of the bus garages and again, shrink the size of the system that we have to maintain on a daily basis. As Mark mentioned, uh, also these severe cuts are, are uh, would be devastating to the region. Uh, uh, they would trigger the transit death spiral where cutting service makes the service less useful, which lowers ridership, which lowers our revenue, which creates another budget problem further on down the line. Um, the other thing to consider with these cuts is that they involve uh, or they would need to require uh, layoffs to a large portion of the Metro staff, which would reduce our uh, ability to deliver service in the future, even if funding were restored. Uh, so there is a very real risk uh, to going off the, the fiscal cliff uh, and hurting our ability to um, restore service in the near future. Uh, just during uh, the, the pandemic, we had a hiring freeze on rail and bus operators, and it has taken Metro uh, uh, quite a while to dig out of that hole to make sure that we have enough rail operators and bus operators on board to be able to provide good service overall. Uh, and more, most importantly, uh, you know, these cuts would not just hurt uh, people who ride the system, it would also hurt the region as a whole, where you would see more congestion, more pollution, uh, and an overall impact to the region's economic uh, competitiveness and quality of life. Uh, on the more optimistic side, uh, uh, there's the opportunity to look at ways that we can make our overall service more efficient, more agile. Uh, so on the rail side, we uh, walk through a number of different ideas for how we might be able to restructure our service to do that. Um, on the bus side, uh, we also have, as many of you know, the Better Bus Network redesign, uh, which has, uh, as part of its recommendation, the development of a year one network uh, that is meant to be a resource neutral um, uh, 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 implementation uh, that so it would match our existing budget levels for service. Um, we're also guided by board policy as we think about our uh, service planning. Uh, so this slide very much uh, uh, focuses on the rail side of the system, but we have the similar standards for bus as well, where we want to uh, think about how we are structuring our overall uh, service uh, and how we are thinking about our longer term investments. Even though we make these service decisions uh, with the budget every year, a lot of that is enabled by much longer term decisions about capital planning uh, and development that set the number of rail cars that we have, the size of our rail yards uh, and things of that nature. You know, an example of this is the eight car trains where that has been a longstanding regional goal uh, and where we are only recently in the position where we are able to offer more and more eight car trains in service. In uh, thinking about how we want to be able to uh, provide a package of service efficiencies, uh, we know that the most important thing to is to maintain good and frequent service. That is the key to generating ridership. And so with all of these, uh, we want to find opportunities where we can operate efficiently while still maintaining that good service. Uh, the options that we're going to walk through uh, will fall along a spectrum of different customer impacts. So some of them will have very low customer impacts with such as shorter trains, where uh, some of the other options are indeed uh, targeted service cuts and reductions that will have higher customer impact. Um, so we'll walk through all of those in just a moment. This is the overall list of the different potential service adjustments that we will discuss. We've grouped them here into different categories uh, that are clustered by letters. So to start, uh, uh, one of the things that we are considering is looking at adapting the length of our peaks of service on the rail system. So uh, before the pandemic, our rush hours were four, four and a half hours long in both the morning and afternoons. Uh, the concept here would be to operate rush hour service at only every two to three hours long in each. Uh, part of the reason for this is that because our overall level of ridership in the peak is lower, there is less crowding and we don't have the capacity need 
for as much service during those key hours. Um, however, we would retain the ability to increase that service in the future if we start to see more and more crowding during peak hours. It's important to note that the peaks are still our busiest times. Like the shape of the overall uh, ridership throughout the day is very similar to what we saw uh, before the pandemic. It's just at a lower overall level. And so this is one way that we might be able to uh, operate more efficiently and adapt to how uh, customers are traveling today. Another option is to look at how we might be able to staff some of our stations more efficiently. Uh, we have two different concepts here uh, that look at reducing staffing at some of our stations that have multiple mezzanines and multiple entrances. Um, so the, the table here shows five stations where we used to close um, station entrances on nights and weekends. Uh, the concept here would be looking at unstaffing those entrances uh, uh, during those same periods. Uh, there's also the option of, of potentially looking at unstaffing certain entrances on a full-time basis uh, throughout the entire day, which would be able to um, uh, save some additional money. Uh, there are lots of considerations to make sure that we're able to still offer um, accessible service uh, in the event that we would need to close one of these entrances, that we're not cutting off access to an elevator or things like that. We want to also make sure we have uh, the, the technology in place to be able to use our video uh, capabilities to make sure we're monitoring uh, these entrances uh, for um, customer safety. As we move into the more impactful uh, versions, uh, another option on the table is to change some of our service headways. So the option, the concept here is to look at either delaying the implementation of some of the service changes in the FY24 budget uh, that have not yet been implemented or potentially rolling back some of those changes. Uh, so for example, we have not yet increased peak orange line service. Uh, that could be rolled back uh, same uh, for weekend service on the green and yellow lines. That could be rolled back to every eight minutes from the plan for every six. Uh, one of the considerations there is, you know, there is concern about potential crowding in some of those uh, areas. Uh, we also, again, don't want to be rolling back service when we are trying to grow our ridership overall. And any of those changes would need to be uh, uh, examined closely for their equity impacts uh, for the areas that they serve. Another option is to look at using shorter trains. Uh, the, the theory here is by uh, operating shorter trains, we would use uh, less overall traction power uh, and uh, save money in that manner. Uh, the other way that we'd be able to save money with this is by reducing the overall number of rail cars we need for service on any given day, which can reduce the maintenance need uh, for the number of cars we need to put out on any given day. There are two broad ways you could go about doing this. One is to cut trains during the service day. Uh, Metro previously would do this, where we would have longer trains during rush hour and shorter trains during late night and off peak periods. Uh, this has some limited benefits by reducing car miles, but it also does add cost. Uh, there are more yard operators required to make those changes on a regular basis and to move the unused cars back to the rail yard. So uh, it doesn't save much money. The other option is to consider running uh, shorter car, shorter trains all day long. And so this could look like a mix of six and eight car trains, perhaps assigning a single line to have all six car trains. Uh, doing so could reduce the overall peak vehicle requirement in a way that enables us to uh, you, uh, realize some savings on uh, maintenance, potentially parking some of our oldest and uh, uh, least reliable rail cars. Another option we have is uh, uh, to change the service patterns on our rail system. Uh, this is uh, something that's come up before. Uh, we only have a limited number of locations where we might be able to uh, fundamentally change the structure of our rail service, where we have the infrastructure to do so. Uh, some of those locations also could present some risks to, to service delivery. Um, and of course, there are going to be substantial uh, service reductions for the customers riding beyond some of these turn back points. So we have five total concepts listed here. Uh, the 
including turnbacks on the red line where half the trains would turn at Grosvenor and Silver Spring. Turnbacks for the blue or silver lines at Stadium Armory. It's important to note that the concept here would be only one of those two services. The other would continue to run through to downtown Largo, as well as some more uh, 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 relatively new ideas such as turning all blue line trains around at Arlington Cemetery. So the blue line would operate only as a shuttle within Virginia or turning half of all the silver line trains around at Wheelie Avenue uh, as all silver line trains did before opening of, of silver line phase two. Um, depending upon the uh, 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 option uh, selected that could uh, save a, a substantial amount of money, but at uh, an increased cost uh, of, of uh, customer impact. And another option that we have uh, on the table is to look at changes to the span of service. Uh, so one option here is to reduce the overall weekly hours of service by two hours. Uh, so instead of closing at 1 a.m. on Friday and Saturday nights, uh, we would close at midnight seven days a week. Uh, well, some of the considerations here is again, uh, equity impacts uh, with our late night customers. Uh, it's a limited uh, operational savings. Uh, and it could introduce uh, some added costs if we were to try to add that service back to us uh, in order to serve special events. On the bus side, uh, it's a there's a lot of potential options, but we what we are showing here is a list of 14 of Metro's lowest performing routes, uh, which could be on the table to uh, either be reduced in service or eliminated. Uh, there's also the option to shorten some routes where a rail connection is uh, possible uh, in order to avoid areas with high traffic congestion, uh, consolidating routes where there's overlapping service, uh, or to look at uh, options where we have complementary services provided by some of the other operators in the region. Uh, again, the, the ideal version of this would be to implement the year one network for the Better Bus Network redesign, uh, but again, depending upon the overall uh, 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 budget situation that may uh, uh, may not be uh, feasible. So if you were to add up all of these different options and put them all on one table, uh, this is a summary of the overall uh, impacts in terms of the estimated change in ridership, the trips positively and negatively impacted, and the net operating savings uh, for each. Uh, in the far uh, right hand side, there's also a preliminary equity scan to look at whether there is a potential finding of a disparate impact or a disproportionate burden. That will be subject to further review because, of course, that needs to be evaluated for the entire network as a whole. So I want to emphasize how that these are all preliminary and also that many of these concepts would be mutually exclusive with each other. So you can't simply just add up all of the different. Uh, concepts together, uh, but it would have to be a, a logical combination of some of these different service options. Um, on the positive side, there's also the opportunity to make some targeted service improvements that could be packaged together with some of these cuts. Um, I won't go into too, uh, too much detail here, but those could also be extending the hours of operation on the rail system. In the FY24 service optimization, we also considered these options, which would be either a late night extension until 2 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays, or opening earlier on the weekends at 6 a.m. Uh, on the bus side, there's also the opportunity to invest in some of those routes that are seeing crowding by adding some additional capacity in order to relieve that pressure. Um, and uh, also the uh, uh, one of the concepts from the Better Bus Network Redesign is the idea of adding a supplemental uh, airport overnight service to both uh, National Airport and Dulles uh, that would complement the rail service when the rail system is not running. Uh, altogether, the package, uh, uh, the cost of those uh, could be anywhere between 14 and a half to 16 million dollars. I want to have a brief note about Metro access uh, just to give a sense of where uh, uh, things stand there. 
Uh, for Metro Access, uh, we have about 1.39 million trips taken in FY23. Uh, for that customer base, there are 36,000 uh, customers overall. Uh, however, approximately 20% of those customers are, uh, account for around 70% of the overall trips. Uh, we've also seen a big increase in our Abilities Ride program with 566,000 trips in FY23. Uh, one of the things we will have to look at in the uh, severe service cut scenarios is limiting Metro Access service to just the area uh, that is legally required by federal regulations. So the table on the right shows the current cost estimate of our current policy, which is above and beyond what is required uh, by those regulations. So as we shift uh, from service into fares, I want to first start with this chart, which looks at Metro fares uh, in both nominal dollars on the left and inflation adjusted dollars on the right. Uh, so this gives a sense of how uh, our fares have changed in real terms over time. So we, we have uh, the red line showing the bus fare uh, and it is overlaid over the rail minimum fare, showing that inflation adjusted terms, those flares have been hovering around $2 uh, since the system's inception. Uh, you can also see the dark blue line with the rail maximum fare has a little bit more variation, but has been uh, at roughly the same level uh, over Metro's history. Uh, the dashed blue line shows the average paid rail fare which again had been hovering um, inflation adjusted in terms of about $3 for many years. It started to increase um, in the 20 teens and then has decreased recently with uh, some of the fare policy changes that we've made, such as the weekend $2 flat fare um, and the late night $2 fare, as well as the overall reduction in ridership from the pandemic. To look at some potential fare increase scenarios. One of the uh, benefits of the change in the fare structure that the board adopted for FY24 is that by eliminating the difference between the peak and off peak system, the, the structure is set up to allow for a percentage change to the overall structure as a whole without having any disproportionate impacts uh, for uh, 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 any of our um, minority or low income communities. So this table looks at a number of different percentage increase scenarios that how they would increase the overall base fare for bus and rail, which also includes the late night and weekend flat fare and how they would change the rail maximum fare as well. And with the corresponding estimates for the ridership and revenue that they could generate. Uh, and how that would uh, change compared to our FY25 uh, estimate. The important thing to note here is that as these fare increases get bigger on a percentage term, uh, there's a lot less confidence in, in how accurate these predictions may be as there's a much bigger risk uh, and uncertainty with a very large change in the fare structure overall. We also wanted to take a look at parking. Uh, this, these two graphics show parking utilization and how it has changed since uh, 2019 until now. So back in 2019, we had all of our parking facilities with a utilization above 40%. Uh, and today, only 12 of our parking facilities have a utilization over 40%. And only four of them are above 80%. All of those are uh, parking lots that are on the smaller side. Um, it's a, it's a very substantial change uh, from before the pandemic to now about how people are using our overall parking um, infrastructure. We did want to look at a couple of different options for how we could change our parking rates. Uh, so we have here two different versions. In P1, we're looking at increasing the parking rates uh, in the same percentage increases as we showed with the fares overall. Um, the main takeaway here is that the combination of the impact to the overall rail ridership plus the parking fees yields a relatively small uh, revenue impact 
uh, because again, the parking utilization is currently quite low. In uh, concept P2, the idea here would be to uh, restructure our parking rates at uh, stations that do have high utilization and and consider lowering parking rates at stations that have low parking utilization. So in order to try to uh, uh, incentivize users to make use of those uh, less utilized stations while distance, uh, you know, discouraging people from using uh, stations that are uh, where the parking facilities are already full. So when you want to step back and look at the overall budget gap situation, again, uh, these this slide walks through five different scenarios with different variations on preventative maintenance transfers and uh, service cuts. Uh, so scenarios one and two assume that there are no service cuts uh, whatsoever that the uh, board would recommend uh, to the jurisdictions that they uh, fund, uh, uh, and they make up the gap uh, with additional subsidy to balance the budget. Uh, scenarios four and five uh, uh, presume that there is no additional subsidy available and that the budget has to be budget gap has to be closed with major and severe service cuts. Uh, and scenario three in the middle uh, would represent a package of some of the targeted service cuts in the, the, the slides that we overviewed here, as well as a fair increase. Um, but it would still require an additional uh, subsidy in this uh, scenario of $315 million from the jurisdictions. This speaks to the, the earlier conclusion that these targeted cuts can help reduce the size of the overall budget deficit, but cannot close it. Uh, in scenarios four and five, to give a sense of the customer impacts, uh, you would need severe and major service cuts to come close to closing that gap. Uh, in scenario four, this amounts to an approximate 33% cut in service, and in scenario five, it's a 60% cut in service. For scenarios three, four, and five, they would all assume a fair increase. Um, but in these severe cut scenarios, we're looking at no metro access service beyond the regulatory requirements, large reductions in the number of bus lines operating and in the headways, uh, same for rail service as well. Uh, these are the doomsday uh, uh, options and uh, the ones that would trigger the overall uh, transit death spiral. I want to briefly uh, touch on some of the implications for uh, capital funding. One of the options that the board is considering is using um, the preventative maintenance transfer, which is a accounting mechanism of taking some of the preventative maintenance activity that Metro is doing and uh, using that, uh, uh, paying for it out of the capital budget in order to close uh, part of the, the gap in the operating budget. Um, there is a limit for how much the Federal Transit Administration allows for you to transfer from one to the other. Uh, the, the trade off here is that by using money from the capital side, it reduces our overall ability to uh, fund needed investments. Some of these strategic uh, 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 and priority investments could be at risk, such as building of the heavy rail, heavy repair and overall facility, which is important to our overall fleet maintenance strategy. It could also put at risk the option orders for expanding our 8,000 series fleet of the future. It would mean uh, potentially being unable to follow through on the purchase of zero emission buses and bus garages. Um, and it would mean we would have uh, no additional capacity for uh, investing in our next next generation signaling system or in doing the planning uh, and development work for the blue, orange, and silver corridor improvements. So just to, uh, to close the presentation here with a brief uh, summary of the overall timeline and where things stand right now. So as we were meeting here right at the beginning of November, coming up in December, uh, the general manager will issue the proposed budget. 
And because of uh, existing uh, uh, contracts and contractual arrangements uh, coming in January, uh, there's a six month advance notice um, for uh, uh, potential layoff notices for many of our staff, as well as a potential hiring freeze. Uh, this uh, uh, timeline doesn't necessarily line up very uh, well with our uh, typical board process, uh, where we would have uh, uh, public hearings in March um, with the board adopting the budget in April um, in order to have operators pick schedules in June uh, and for the budget to officially take effect in July of 24. Um, so just to, to emphasize the, 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 the challenge of trying to build a, a, a budget uh, in order to uh, both meet the uh, legal timeline, but also uh, deal with the large budget gap and the uh, need to plan for multiple different scenarios. Uh, that is the end of the uh, slides that I have prepared. So I'm happy to mark if you have any closing remarks or otherwise you can take any questions that the rack might have. Yeah, no, I'm eager for, for discussion and questions and I mean, the first thing there is the GM proposed budget is in is in December. So this is a good I mean, this is really the month of, of November where feedback and input can have a lot, a lot of value as the initial budget is put together. Once the budget is put together, that's also a time when the budget does often change, you know, through through the between a proposal and approval. But um, the intention actually of, of putting all this stuff out there with the board and um, with this group and in public is to you know, facilitate getting some some early feedback so that the actual proposal can incorporate it as best as possible. Well, thank you both very much for uh, this presentation. Um, I know it was eye opening when I saw it uh, last week. I think it's still eye opening today and more things caught my attention as a uh, you know, you're going through it. So I'm gonna open up the floor to um, members of the RAC to uh, ask questions and start a discussion. Um, and uh, there's a hand up, but I can't see who it is. I think it was Cole, if that's you, go ahead. It is, okay. it is. Um, thanks guys for that 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 presentation. Um, quick question that might kind of help guide our, com our conversation here in this meeting. So do we know if, um, Randy's budget will be reflective of if of the worst case scenario, assuming no subsidy increase. Does he plan on presenting a few different budgets based on kind of the, the scenarios you presented? Um, so I think obviously we all would prefer scenario one and we get all of our jurisdictions to meet that um, that budget gap. But I think for our conversation, it might be helpful to know kind of what Randy's planning to to do in terms of the budget scenario. Thanks. Thanks for the question. The reality is going to be that we're going to have to keep a more than one scenario essentially um, in play until the point where it's actually the funding issue is actually is actually resolved. So so as much as no one might want to prefer one of the severe scenarios, um, it has to be contemplated. It has to go through the public participation um, process until we can we can be sure it does not have to be. So there'll probably be at least two scenarios. Cole, do you have anything else? Um, otherwise, we're going to move on to Brian for um, his uh, question. Uh, I'm good for now. Let's. I'll see what some other folks have to say, and I'm sure I'll have more to chime in on. Great, thanks. Brian, go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mark and Alex, as always, uh, for coming and taking uh, your time out of the evening to speak to the RAC. Uh, I'm going to ask a question, and I don't even know if you can answer it because it is a pretty sensitive one both for a public meeting, but also for the uncertainty of where we are. But are there any meaningful discussions about establishing a dedicated funding source for our operational budget for WMATA? 
Uh, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, I can say in in general that these conversations have been have been frequent and and ongoing. I know the, the general manager um, was meeting with the DC Council um, and mayor's office just just yesterday, and there's been a number of meetings with officials from all over the region, and that's gonna that's gonna definitely continue um, all throughout this throughout this process. Okay, and um, do you know, because I guess the only thing, and this is kind of more editorial, is I'm, is, do you think that there is going to be an effort to release a proposed plan anytime soon? Because I feel like we're gonna get this presentation next year and the year after and the year after and the year after unless we have a dedicated funding source because there's structural issues involved. Um, and I just hope that we don't lose our eye on the goal of creating a sustainable system. And I know that's not Mark and Alex, your responsibility. Um, and, and I think it's incumbent on the rack to advocate for that. Um, but I'm, I'm just fearful that uh, this presentation that you just gave us is gonna be a recurring theme uh, in perpetuity. Yeah. No, thanks for the question. I think that's that's right that there's a long-term structural issue. And if we address closing the budget gap this year without a long-term structural solution, then that part of it, at least part of it, will roll over to to fiscal year, fiscal year 26 and and so on. So I certainly certainly agree with that. But the one thing that I, that I will add, and I know the general manager has mentioned this in, in public before as well, is that the um, in any of these scenarios that it require additional subsidy in order to balance the budget, uh, that is uh, capped at 3% by legislation in both Maryland and Virginia. So in order to exceed that cap, it will require some action by those legislatures, which is part of the overall challenge on the timing. Uh, but it does also mean that those you know, legislators in, in both Maryland and Virginia are uh, aware of the issue and are engaged and, and, and certainly also aware, not just that this is a uh, issue with our FY25 budget, but with the longer term structural deficit that we're facing as well. Uh, Mahalia. Thank you, Mark and Alex for the presentation and for your time. Um, so in your presentation, you mentioned that by summer 2024, there's going to be more stations um, with a new fare gate, uh, which would lower uh, incidents of fare jumping and capture more um, paying customers. Is there a forecast for perhaps how that could help close the budget gap, um, being able to capture more of the fare? Yeah, we're still working through exactly how the numbers how the numbers will play out. But so far, with the the eleven stations that are done, it has reduced fare evasion about about seventy percent. So it's gone from in, in at a system level, we've had about eleven to thirteen percent fare evasion rate, which is higher than it was several several years ago. And and we know that. You know, once you install these gates, we do reduce fare evasion. There still continues to be some, some fare evasion. And then, you know, we know there's going to be some conversion of people paying, and maybe some people might end up not riding, riding at all. So figuring exactly how that's going to, to shake out is still a little bit uncertain. In terms of magnitude, um, I think we, we referenced it could be, uh, you know, 10 to 20 million Twenty million dollars, but that, that's a very uncertain number. But it gives you a sense of it's not a number that's big enough to uh, be one of the major factors in in closing the gap. But it is important that every dollar dollar does count. And it's also important for those all those other reasons that that Alex mentioned in terms of you know, safety and customer perceptions. Mahalia, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Okay. So I have a, um, a couple questions for you. Um, the first one is, 
and I understand that things with contracts, you know, you know, are, are depends on when you know when you purchase it and all those kind of things. Um, but does it is there a chance that delaying purchase and actually signing on the contract for the eight thousand series trains until we get dedicated funding? And I'm not sure when that would uh, that contract would actually occur. But is that something that is on the table? Just completely not even purchasing it, and then that would save like five hundred and some million per year until. Just wondering. I we we are under contract right now for our base order, uh, which is for two hundred and fifty six rail cars, um, and so that that is that the our contractor is building a new facility in, in Hagerstown, um, so that that is underway, and that won't uh, uh, change. Uh, the the real question for that will be uh, how many options Metro could take. Uh, we have options for to purchase a total of up to 800 rail cars. Um, and so that is where the real uncertainty is. Um, and then also to understand what the impacts of that would be, right? So the, the base order um, is uh, replaces part, but not all of our oldest rail cars in the fleet. And so if we were only to take the base order, uh, that would mean uh, eventually we, we, we either need to continue running our 2000 and 3000 series cars past the end of their useful life with declining reliability, or we would need to permanently shrink the size of our uh, rail fleet um, in a way that would limit our ability to increase service uh, in the future. And so those are some of the trade-offs that we're, we're, we're trying to, to uh, help uh, the, the board get a better handle on. Uh, I, I don't know the specific timing. Uh, each of the options has its own uh, uh, deadline for when it must be exercised by. Um, but yes, it, we, we are certainly looking at that and trying to get a better handle on exactly what those uh, those implications are. Thank you. And um, another question, and this is something that you may or may not be, um, be able to answer, as Brian quote him, the sensitive part of it is, um, when you talk about potential layoffs, um, does that include transit police or other uh, directly safety type personnel? I mean, it certainly, it certainly could. There's not a specific, you know, down to the, down to the position and number, uh, find, like final, final plan, but that's the kind of thing where based on the timing um, is gonna be forced and have to, have to be figured out in these severe cut scenarios um, in the next, next next month or two okay and uh, my final question is um has there been a study to see how um, the low, lower ridership due to the service or, you know potential service cuts would economic economically impact um, dc or downtown or other areas near rail stations because what I'm, I'm driving at is that you know there's always the talk of we need the workers to come back um, but then there's also this conversely the service cut part of it so just wondering if there's been studies that you have kind of like going back and forth with um, the local leaders of here's what will happen with these service cuts that your economic um, issues. No, that's a that's a that's an excellent point. I, I know we have some some more uh, general um, uh, studies about the economic benefits of, of service. Um, I don't know that we have anything about these specific uh, uh, severe cuts, um, but in general, uh, it, they would certainly be devastating, especially if we get to the point where we are forced to make those kinds of decisions to shrink the system that would involve closing the entire system at you know 9 or 10 p.m., um, really reducing service uh, down to a bare bones level, that sort of thing. Uh, that would certainly be uh, 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 devastating for the overall economy, um, but uh, the specific numbers, no, we don't quite have uh, a, a, an estimate yet, but we have been in touch with um, the various economic development folks around the region, um, and, and they are certainly aware of the importance of metro service in general. Okay, um, so looks like all the hands have been raised. Does anybody uh, want another shot at uh, questions or editorials or comments or anything else? From the rack, Dina. 
Actually, yeah, it's my job to ask this question. So you <laughs> mentioned equity and an equity analysis, and I wanted to know whether that included gender and other similar factors that relate to people's actual safety and perception of safety as you think about different cuts um, at different times of day? That's a good question. So um, when we talk about doing, I'll say we, we think about this in at least two ways. So when we talk about doing um, like certain equity analyses that are required under Title VI of the, the Civil Rights Act, that's traditionally focuses on you know, demographics in like two categories, um, like income based. So like a disproportionate burden on um, lower income customers or a disparate impact on on minority customers. Um, and so that has tended not to focus on on the gender question, but realizing that is you know something that was probably underappreciated, underlooked at and really since started um, launching and developing a like a gender equity action plan. I mean, in general, yeah. and some other agencies have done this and, you know, seen different different patterns and women are actually a majority of transit riders in most places and you know, the, the ways people take trips times a day do tend to be tend to be different. So for, focusing on uh, more of that as, as an agency. I'm curious, though, since you raised the question, is there a, a kind of particular uh, concern or point with regard to the kind of the, the safety time of day that wanted to, wanted to um, in this case. Yeah, I mean, I'm a woman who rides the, um, uses public transit. And so if it's cut, I can take an example. Like I went to a show many months, maybe a year ago. Um, I live in Mount Pleasant. It was at U Street. I should have ridden my, rode my bike because by the time I came back, like when the show was done, I had very few transit options and like Uber was like 50 bucks to go two miles and ended up taking one of the buses up 16th Street. Didn't feel totally awesome about that. And then I had to, the last mile was like going to be a problem no matter what. But it just, you know, having more options, ones that feel safe um, are important. And I know that you guys have the, um, the uh, you can request to the courtesy stop now on the bus, which is awesome. Uh, but also just finally, you know, the income and the racial ethnic, um, issues cross cut gender, um, in a big way. So, you know, they're intersectional and speaking of the gender action plan, um, I, I had heard about it, um, in a few places and we had talked about getting a briefing here. So when the time is right, I think that would be a great presentation for this group. Yeah, I'm sure the team working on it would be very happy, very happy to hear that. John, I'm sure can help with that. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Dina. That was um, a great question. Um, anything else from anybody? Uh, John. If I could just, I just wanted to chime in, um, you know, again, as as Mark mentioned, um, this is sort of the sprint before the general manager puts out his proposed budget or proposed budget scenarios in November. And so this is a really key opportunity if there are any particular, you know, any of the scenarios or service or um fair scenarios that alex reviewed with you that stand out either as like oh that would be the end of the world or eh, i could live with that more so than this um you know obviously there'll be a whole um there'll be a whole public engagement process um in the late winter early spring um to weigh in but being able to get in on the ground floor with some, you know, if there are specific things that any members either see as as absolute non-starters or, OK, maybe we can explore that more. You know, nobody obviously is is in favor of 
nobody on the rack and nobody at Metro is in favor of reductions, um, you know, cutting service, raising fares, all that stuff. But, um, you know, if there and if there's anything in there that falls in either of those two categories, this would be a, a great time to uh, to get that information to the board to sort of inform their discussions with with the general manager and his staff um, in advance of him dropping his budget in mid December. On that on that note, John, um, I'll ask uh, Mark and Alex um, just from my observations of on the train. I come from um, I've been taking lately the Herndon Metro Station over to Metro Center, um, and you know, understanding that nothing, one not one cut or fix is going to solve things. It's all kind of like this whole, you know, kind of like mishmash puzzle that you expertly are putting together. But at least from that end of it, is there talk? Of, I know you have like turnbacks on the silver line, the Virginia side of it. At least I know you. So it's either going to be one and the other on both sides of it, but um, are you to consider just like completely almost bagging a big part of the silver line um, kind of whether it's phase one or phase two of it, just basically because when I'm on the on the train, Wheelie Reston usually has a bunch of people. Tyson's has a bunch of people, but a lot of the other uh, Tyson's area like McLean and other ones have very few people getting in, on and off the trains. Um, Herndon, there's hardly the parking lots pretty much a ghost town when I go there. Um, you know, Innovation Center, the same thing. Reston Town Center, it's a little, you know, it's not. It's, you ever thought about just for that, just almost bagging it and just having Tyson's, Wheelie, Reston, and then maybe Dallas and just completely shutting down the rest of the Silver Line in Virginia? And would that make a difference, I guess, is yeah. what I mean. I, I, I'll say this is not something fun or exciting to, to contemplate, but as part of these severe cut, Scenarios. I think station closures are something we've been really forced to look at. I mean, the trade-off there is closing someone's station completely cuts off access to the people using that station. So it's not a 20% reduction or 50%. It's a it's 100%, and the station's operating more value. On on the other side, as we talked about, like most of the costs are actually maintaining all this and operating all this fixed fixed infrastructure, like the stations and the tracks and the signal and all all those systems. And so shutting down a station does actually help reduce um, reduce some of those some of those fixed expenses that you you don't get into if you're just changing the the train the train frequency. These are some of the, the tough, unpleasant things that we've been forced to to really, really start start contemplating. Yeah, and that's what got me thinking of that when you're talking about parking as well or incentivizing people like, okay, so maybe you reduce or completely get rid of parking, like parking fees at Wheelie, for example. So that way everybody who lives, you know, west of Wheelie, kind of, you know, that's not gonna park at Dallas, can just park at Wheelie, then make that kind of like a hub like it used to be at the beginning of the Silver Line. Um, you know, like I just kind of like, again, I'm kicking myself for even bringing this up because um, it's not fun, but I'm just, it just got, you got me thinking when kind of John mentioned that as well as your presentations, just, just kind of throwing it out there as a, as, and I know, people on the silver line when I talked to them during my outreach, a lot of them also noticed that yeah, it's like a ghost town at certain stations along it. So I'm just, I think people actually could live with certain ways as long as there's parking, at least at some of the stations and you cut the costs, which you've already com contemplated. I, I will also add that, yes, I, I think we're, that that's certainly something that we would have to look at in, in one of these severe cut scenarios. Um, one other observation or two other observations about the silver line, though, is that you know, phase two is still relatively new. I know it seems like it's, it's been around in construction and planning for many, many years, but it, it, it has only been operational for less than a year. Uh, we're coming up on the one year um, uh, uh, anniversary uh, uh, this month. Um, and so the, the ridership will, of course, take time to build uh, uh, over time. It's a it's a long term investment. Uh, uh, the other thing to note is that although the Silver Line does have a, a lot of new stations that have relatively low ridership, as a whole, by the time those trains reach the core, because the Silver Line tends to have more stations overall than the Orange Line, the Silver Line trains themselves are often more full than the Orange Line trains when they get into Arlington and then into the district. Uh, so uh, as a collective whole, with all of those stations, uh, those those small numbers do add up by the time you get into the into the center of the system. Uh, so that's part of the, the, the trade off and looking at, at the network as a whole overall. Okay, thank you. That's good uh, insight. 
Um, absent anybody else, uh, I think we are, we've got a lot of information, a lot to um, contemplate, and this has been super helpful and a bit scary, um, but I definitely appreciate both of you coming here and spending your evening talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so on that uplifting <laughs> um, notes, so the next item on our agenda is um, outreach member report out. So um, the first thing I think what I wanna do is it's 7.15, so we're making pretty good time on this, is that I think um, this is a good point for the outreach part of the agenda is to talk about writer engagement plan or our or a potential writer engagement plan for the budget and the budget season. And then we can get into anything else that writers have raised to rack members um, during the month as part of our individual outreach. So we're getting to the point where, as they mentioned in the presentation, that we should go beyond talking and start to, start to act on behalf of writers. Um, because as we just saw the GM's proposed budget cuts, some of these various scenarios are coming probably in December and the conversation among elected officials regarding dedicated funding and this 3% subsidy cap are a little bit muddled. I've seen some news reports where they're talking. I know they're, the board meeting, they talked about how they're talking, they, the presentation, they said that, but it's just very all over the place of where the legislative legislators in the region stand. So as one part of the puzzle, writers, we've talked about this, should be heard to help orient the discussion so that elected officials can act kind of in an expedited manner because of the schedules of how the legislative calendars are working out. So as most of you have gotten back to me about, um, and DC 10 has as well, they were here a few months ago, is that we've all heard from writers who still think the budget issue is more of the same. Um, most of you have sent me emails saying like, yeah, everyone says we go through this every year and you know it'll, it'll work itself out like it always does. But of course, this time, because of the subsidy cap and the lack of dedicated funding, it's a little bit or a lot different than in the years past. And I think most writers, and probably including myself to some degree, didn't really, the light doesn't come on for a while. So again, with the legislative calendar and imminent budget proposals coming out, um, I proposed by email to all of you kind of an adaption of what we originally talked about, where each of us through our outreach record like using our phones or whatever, a quick 10 to 15 second video of riders uh, responding to some version of the question, what would a 60% cut in Metro service mean to you? And um, as I mentioned, these videos can be members of the rack as well. So if we have a hard time finding people that wanna be on camera, all of us can, I know not everyone's here tonight, but we can all make a video of it and put it into like a montage. Um, but obviously the more uh, riders we can get, the better. Um, but I think regardless, we need to get moving on this. Um, you know, November 16th is the board meeting. That's when I, I think the idea would be to put a video, kind of attach it to our report and then play it at the meeting. Um, and if we get the video submitted, I think November 10th, which is really, it's like next Friday. But if we were just talking to people and just, we each just get like two or three writers, or if we can't even do that just ourselves, um, then we can play it at the meeting and then we can use those videos for to pass along writer voices. So we're not advocating or I guess we're not lobbying is the right word, but we are um, basically just letting elected officials and region, regional stakeholders know that, hey, we have this kind of little montage of videos. Um, this is just a example, like a sample size that, um, you know, that ex explaining how this is very personal for writers. Every writer has a story. It's from all across the transit zone. And then we can use it as an impetus to, uh, you know, to whether it's writing letters or op-eds um, or anything else that all of you can think of to kind of put the voice out or the word out for the writers using that. So again, even if it's just all of us, we can do this since again, we represent all the transit zone. Um, so I'm gonna just really just go down the list if you don't mind, I hate doing that to people, but um, I just really wanna get your thoughts, see if you can commit to making a video or at least through your networks or yourselves to just kind of put it together and send it to me and John so we can um, kind of create it. So I just look at the list I have at Brian, you're the worst first guy up. Um, just get your thoughts. Um, if you think this is an idea we can do, um, can you commit to uh, assisting with this? And if you have any other ideas, by all means. Yeah, most definitely. Um, 
I think just uh, John in the follow up to this meeting, just articulating it exactly what you need from us and when you need it in whatever format you need it. Um, but I think it's a great idea and I agree. Uh, I think demonstrating uh, the impact of something like this can have on, on actual individuals can be, uh, can be very powerful, uh, not only just for the members of the board, but the members of the public, including our elected officials. Thank you, Brian. And what I, what I say, I think, again, I think my initial timeline, and we can get an email out after the meeting, like, or, you know, this week to um, kind of get into um, whether November 10th is feasible, which, I, you know, or whatever, however, I don't know how hard it is to merge videos and stuff like that. Um, but I think we can, we can work through that. And I think then once we get the, the montage together, then us as a rack can then coordinate kind of like what we're going to use it for besides displaying it to the, to the board, which is kind of like preaching to the choir a little bit, but how we can leverage it to, um, you know, to kind of get the writer's voice amplified. Um, and then of course, any letter that goes out in the name of the rack would be approved by all of you and all of us, um, you know, all that. And so we're not, you know, we, everyone will have a chop red line document, whatever it is. Um, and I'm still talking to DC 10. They had the same problem as we did in just getting writers to show up. But I think they like the idea of the montage. So I'm going to try to work with them to see if they can access their network. So more to follow on that. But thank you, Brian. Um, I'm going to go just, I'm going straight down the list as I see it. So Cole. Yeah, I, I mean, I can for sure at the very least do myself and see if I can't get some people in my networks that I know use Metro often to talk about what, what a cut would mean to them. Okay, great. And does November 10th as a preliminary target date um, work for you? And I'll say Brian as well. I think so, yeah. Especially if you keep them short, I think I can get yeah. a few people I know that I can just, bully is the wrong word, but to very strongly suggest that they uh, participate. It's 10 to 15 seconds. So yeah, we don't want, yeah. we don't, we do not want to diatribe. We want to keep this short on purpose because as you know, most of you know, in the world of sound bites, you know, people are going to start, the circus music is going to go off in people's heads and there's a, there's a, uh, we can overkill it. And that's why, um, I mean, I think 30 would have been at the top end of it, of uh, writer voices of that. Um, we don't want to have like four because then we just, it looks weird, but somewhere there's a happy medium where we can say, this is a sample. Um, this is just a reflection from riders across the transit zone. And the beauty of the rack is that we're all from across the transit zone. We each take buses or trains or both. So I think that works. Um, and I know um, our numbers of this meeting have trailed off, but we can, we can, I can email everyone specifically and just be like, hey, can you commit? Um, and I see some hands up. Um, Dina, you have your hand up again. Let's, we'll go to you. You're at the top of my list now. <clears throat> Thanks. Um... Yeah, because you were about to call me. Um, I struggle <laughs> with this a little bit because the reality is <laughs> that at a systems level, we shouldn't have to deal with this kind of funding issue at a metro in a metropolitan area, certainly not in the nation's capital. And so I just struggle with like how you really even solve this problem. Like the minute you cut like service is already a little dodgy so the minute you you cut down on service you have a lot of unhappy riders like we get that but i mean re i don't really understand the real alternatives other than raising the cap um for what the jurisdictions can give and then what are they reasonably going to add to the coffers my understanding is, and John, this might be more of a question for you. Uh, actually, John, you might you want to answer that one, or so. Um, I guess a couple a couple of things, and I mean, I hope this answers your question. I mean, what we end up with is is you know worse service. Um, it's not a solution that it's not a situation that anybody wants to see. Yeah, but it's that. certainly, you know, it's certainly a situation that is the reality in a lot of other um, metropolitan areas across the nation. You know, I mean, I grew up in Detroit and or suburban Detroit. And if I, I don't remember any buses coming more than once every half hour, most of them come once an hour still. 
um, you know, you go to that level of service, it's a possibility. Um, in terms of the the three percent cap, you know, the discussion and Regina Sullivan, our government relations person, had a conflict tonight, and I'm hoping um, she can offer a much more insightful um, commentary on this, hopefully in December, um, to explain a little bit better. Uh, what's been talked about is sort of, you know, the subsidy growth cap was implemented to keep, um, you know, to to help encourage Metro to to find ways to keep costs down. And, um, you know, because we don't have that sort of direct taxing authority like the cities and counties do. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, one that came in a bad time, given that inflation, you know, up until then was relatively low. Right. Um, as as Alex and Mark went over in their presentation, you know, three percent was a little bit higher than inflation. Well, now three percent is nowhere near the rate of inflation. Right. So um, that has kind of that was a that was a bad timing. Um, what the talk has been around is sort of. I'm not going to I'm not going to find the right word and uh, sort of like a rebalancing of the subsidy cap or a reset, maybe to recognize that the reality that we're in in 2016 or 17 when that was set is very different than the reality that we're in now. Um, and if you can sort of reset those levers, Metro would still have to be, um, you know, committed to constraining its, its expenses on a year to year basis. Um, that so it sounds like I'm overthinking the problem and I just need to be like. These <laughs> these cuts have impacts like on riders like me and this is how and I'm done. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't I, have to I solve would, the problem for them. I just have to say no, why it's no, a bummer. I think you have to make it imperative upon them to solve the problem. So um, my, you know, my, no, go ahead, sorry. Uh, so uh, you're exactly right. My dumb guy version of this is that, um, you know, the, the the Maryland of Virginia, they couldn't give us, they couldn't fix the budget gap, even if they wanted, to, even if we need them to right now, because they have this law that says they can only, they can't go above this number. So that's kind of where the idea of, you know, again, the rack's not going to save the day and solve the problem, but we can be a part of the, you know, the bigger push. Because, you know, because we, as we've talked about, um, you know, WMATA has their governor, government relations people, they have their board, they're all lobbying, they're all doing all the stuff they need to do to get the legislators from Maryland and Virginia to up the cap or remove it or do something with it so that this budget gap gets fixed so that service doesn't get cut so that the system doesn't fall apart and die, right? Um, so, you know, the RACS part of it is, again, we want to stay in our lane, but our lane is the riders and the board can talk numbers and metrics and stuff all they want, but... No one's going to be like, hey, you know, I if there's 30 minute wait times, I can't get to work and I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to start teleworking we can get it because screw this. Right. I, I mean, mean that's, I won't even I, a 15 minute wait is already that's like yes. way beyond my tolerance for public transit. And I think that's what they need to hear, because then because that's kind of like what I brought up the question earlier is that everyone's, you know, federal government and wherever there's like, you got to come to work. You got to come downtown. We, we're going to force you to do that. You know, there's people in Congress that are like, they want to do bills to force, you know, you know, government employer, employees back to work. It's like, okay, but then you're going to give us this craps um, commute. So we can't even make it to work. It's like, you know, screw that. Um, you know, it's just, it's just kind of like this whole, that's where I think the writer voice comes in and be like, Hey, <laughs> You know, this is what it looks like for us. We're human beings, so you're talking about us, but we're here. Yeah, I mean, so I that... can bring the federal employee thing. I'll just, I'll, I'll make something, and uh, I've never done it, but I'm sure I can figure it out. And um, again, it's just like a 15, 10 second. You can even just take your phone, put it on selfie mode, put it on video, and just be like, you know, answer the same question we ask other people: What does 60% cut mean to you? It means. I can't get to work and I'm not going to go to work. It's a mess. Whatever, and, it's, and then it means that, you know, people are, there's road congestion because people are going to, people who can are going to drive. Yeah. Or, but I think, and the people personal. who can't are going to be stuck. And I think it's more keep it personal. So it's like, you know, what are you going to do? It's like, you know, I, I don't want to drive, but I'm going to drive, you know, 
because well i'm not driving to work i work in l'enfant plaza there's no way i'm gonna drive and that's that's your that's your story right it's like i'm screwed i mean that's i mean that's how i view it okay my recommendation that i don't want to take away from pat speaking time is you know if because i know he has his hand up um i know that you all have very diverse networks of folks that you know and and how they use the transit system. Um, and I would encourage you to lean into that when you're talking to people or sort of getting testimony, right? Um, so we, yeah, we we all at the, a couple of months ago at Bryna's um, expert urging, we remember we went with DC10 was here. We went through that whole exercise of writing down networks and groups that we know. And maybe this is the time where we just send them a message, just being like call them up or whatever and say, Hey, we're looking for anyone who wants to make it tell answer this question, make a quick 10 second video, send it to us. Um, and that might be, I think that, you know, because I know it's a little awkward sometimes just chatting up somebody on a bus or a train. I mean, I've done it, I did a lot for the interim report last time. I'm introvert at heart, so it's kind of like it's very uh um weird for me. But um I, I that I think that's a way we can do it. That's a recommendation that I think all of us should do. Um and Pat. You have been patiently waiting. The oh, please. I'm, I'm fine. Actually, I got here late to the tail end of this. So, I, John, I'm going to see if we can maybe get these folks uh, that presented today over to the AAC because I'm sure this was an excellent presentation. Um, technical, sort of technical question with, let's say there, there are routes that are compromised or whatever. Would I be safe to say that Metro Access would be um, compromised? So Pat, um, they said this, I don't know if you had made it to the meeting on last last month, but he said it again today, that um, depending on the scenario they do, they would mm -hmm. reduce Metro access to um, just the regulatory requirements. There would be no nothing additional beyond that, if that makes sense to you. So the bare minimum. My, uh, yeah, I guess my, my question on the regulatory requirements would be, um, the fixed route, of course, the fixed route service defines it three quarters of a mile within the fixed route service. But if the fixed route service is shut down and not operational, what happens to Metro Access? That's the more yeah. technical part of that question. So you could have subway stations there, but if they're not being used, if they're shut down, I don't know how they would interpret Metro Access. The point of this being is that if I go to my group and say, hey, this may affect metro access <laughs> you may get a lot of angry voices which because these folks depend on this john can you get pat um reach out and maybe get him an answer specific to his question that mm -hmm. he can use sure um do you understand what i'm saying and i certainly can talk to anu john also. I, I i do i do pat right like there's the Metro Access service as it exists today. There's the Metro Access service area. If we, if you dialed it down to the statutorily required three quarters of a mile based on today's service and then based on what's active, based on a cut service in FY 2025. Right. Yeah. What would right. Happen and then mm -hmm. I, I would think all of those things are on the table. Okay, um, I would think but so too. I, you know, yeah. but I, I will let me ask that question, um, rather yeah. than and then, um, yeah, then None shoot from the hip. So yeah. I will, uh, I will follow right. up. Thanks, and I will um, also be talking to Anu. I think this would be an excellent presentation to get in front of AEC, so you've got the voices of the two committees knowing the same things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. OK, thanks. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so I think this has been really productive. Um, you know, I think we have a plan. I think it's something that is manageable for all of us because, I mean, we all have a phone. Um, so I'm just, I'm just taking notes to remind myself to uh, what the email I'm going to say, contact networks. Um, OK, anybody else have anything they want to talk about for this plan? Oh, John. I just want to say so. Um... Just maybe to give you all one extra weekend to um, to go out and bug people. So the tenth is a holiday, um, Veterans Day observed. Right. Um, yeah. I would say just get, if you can get stuff by Monday morning, um, 
you know, we usually send an update to the board Tuesday 13th. before the board meeting on the 16th. So um, by the morning of the 13th, um, you know, I'll I'll try and turn it around and, you know, see what we can do with it. Um, so, so you know someone who can do this, like the technical part of it? I mean, isn't it? I, I assume it's just stringing videos together. Yeah. So we'll figure that out. Um, it it may not it may not be super professional, but we'll see what we can do unless unless okay. that was Mahalia volunteering. Oh, we didn't hear from Mahalia, did we? Uh, no, you did not. But that's oh okay. crap. <laughs> um, I was going to say though, from a editing standpoint, and I I hope I'm not digging my own grave by <laughs> suggesting and then eventually volunteering. But um, for an editing from an editing standpoint, we should also have some standard like everyone should either do landscape or portrait um so that it's kind of all the same um and then yeah just like a few guidelines lighting and things like that um but i mean sure i i, I don't mind stringing together videos can do that well thank you very much so i guess that means you're also in on the on this little endeavor so yeah. Um, appreciate I, it, yeah. and I don't. I, I I know landscape and portrait, but I literally will be just like whatever this happens, <laughs> what do you do it and straight the phone up, not sideways. That's how I envision I'm going to do it. Portrait, Mike. Portrait. That's portrait. <laughs> you know, I do like. Think of the Mona Lisa. That's a portrait. Okay. That I I got landscape trees. Okay. Per, awesome. Thank you for that. I can. I'm not the smartest, uh, but you know, a couple of fries short of a happy meal here, but. We'll, we'll get this done. Um, Bryna. Just a note as you guys are thinking through that, just, um, you know, uh, think about diversity and who you're capturing. So I really appreciate everyone's work on this. Just um, want to make sure we have a diverse group, both um, geographically, uh, you know, use of transit, paratransit, bus, rail, and then, um, you know, demographically diverse age, gender, race, ethnicity. So thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Um, anybody else? I think that was everybody now. Uh, on that note, on Brian's note, I wonder if I know we're a little pressed for time, but maybe just putting out an email listing like who's willing to talk within the rack. And then also if you have someone in mind, just putting like location, age, use of transit and um, gender, race, like just so we have an idea of who has what covered. And then if someone else, someone on the rack has the bandwidth to reach out to people we're not taking boxes for, um, just making sure it's all covered. Perfect. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, yeah, I think, and that's why the, again, the beauty of the rack, at least at a preliminary understanding, it's not filling all of the gaps is that uh, we do have a pretty diverse crowd, um, both demographically and from across the transit zone. So I think we got some of that, but it's not it's not perfect. Um, but it depends, you know, assuming that everybody contributes. Um, but we can, well, I definitely will um, kind of f flesh that out a little bit more so we make sure that we can do that, particularly as we engage with our networks as well to see if we can get, you know, from across and everything like everything that we, Brian had just talked about and you just talked about. So anything else? This is off topic, but that's also my forte. It's back on topic to the Mona Lisa because I overheard in a in the line for like seasonal <laughs> ski rentals a kid ask his mom who was more popular, Leonardo da Vinci or Taylor Swift. And I thought that was a very profound question. Interesting. Are we talking about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles one or the painter artist? You know, <laughs> they were talking guy. about the Mona Lisa and then the painter. <laughs> and I was like, well, do you mean in all of history? This is interesting because you, you can cut long or you can cut deep. Huh. OK. OK. That would, now you're, I'm going to be contemplating that. And I'm starting to think about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles theme song in my head now, even though it's nothing to do with because I'm very lowbrow these days. Um, but is there, we are in the member outreach part. We actually are pretty good at time, but we're going to try to finish this up. Um, so member report out has ever any, apart from all budget stuff, has writers or any, or you in your own experience have any um, observations 
or recommendations or uh, nits or com com you know accommodations or anything like that that you want to put out there. Is this regard that's regarding the presentation and the different no. options they presented? I'm, no, I'm not there yet. I'm just talking about no. just like kind of like um, you know we've seen people jumping fares at launch oh, monitors like that. Um, I got lots um, of stuff. Okay. Um, uh -huh. What do you What do you have? And if you have anything with a recommendation, that would be good. If you yeah, want to bring so, it up now. Yeah, some of this I just know. So I use Columbia Heights a lot. There are schools there, um, so a lot of kids take the metro and get on and off there. There's a lot of jumping of the fare gate and these a lot. I mean, if they're going to school, then they are entitled to the kids ride free card. And that program is run in a way that even if you wanted to, it's very difficult to get a card. Like our school, like an elementary school, they get like 150 at a time. The school has to administer it. So they have to like register everyone and make sure they get the card and to me, that's a losing proposition. And does it make a difference to the fare box, whether these kids use it or not? No. Does it help Metro understand like what is actually a lost fare or not so that they can properly calculate the sort of the delta? Absolutely. Because you wouldn't, I mean, you'd have to come up with some estimate of what percentage of jumpers are people who would be covered by a free pass. And yeah, so that program needs a refresh in how people can get the cards and sort of, I don't know what the lift is on, you know, do they, how much information they collect, whatever it is, I'm guessing it's not working. Great. Thank you, Dina. That is, uh, that's interesting. I've, I've thought about that too as well. So that that's a, yeah. kind of like a common I mean, sense. I mean, um, I think just being at the stop where, I mean, you have, in Lincoln Middle, you have Bell Multicultural, um, just kids coming from all over the place. And they could ride for free. Why are they hopping? And now maybe they have a card and they don't feel like carrying it. I don't know. But Got it. Okay. Anything, uh, anybody else? Or... And in the future, I mean, I know it's just something we kind of spun on you, but this is always on our agenda. So I, I felt the most productive we've been on some of these, like I know Mahalia, you've done this a few times. Dina, you've done this. Um, is just send an email like maybe a day or, or even the day of the meeting so that we can kind of, um, you know, kind of have a list of things or or other RAC members can kind of contemplate it, you know, so it's it's always a little helpful to do that. But um, I mean, we obviously have some, we had some good comments from the um, students uh, earlier in the meeting. So I think we're, we have some things to talk about for yeah. the board, but. Yeah, we do. I mean, that problem is, not unique to that line. I exactly. mean, it happens on the S buses up 16th Street every single day and all the other popular lines. But I, I mean, it's a good point to make. Um, yes. It's accessing education, not other things. And maybe that is a louder voice in some ways. Sure. So, Especially Bethesda Chevy, Chevy Chase, I mean. Yeah. So I'm going to move on um, to Anna Report Committee. Obviously, Lucas is off getting married. Um, so he sent an email. Um, I think we all got that. Um, and I think his email kind of said everything that needs to be said in that one. The only thing I'll add is I'll just urge everybody to uh, contribute. Um, obviously, we're asking a lot of things to contribute. Um, you know, it's all part of I try to keep all the contributions like that to writer outreach, which is in the bylaws kind of our volunteer job at all this. So I, I think it's in line with it. Um, obviously, the point is not to, you know, stress people out or, you know, or, you know, burn you out in volunteer work, because you all have a lot going on in your lives. So, um, you know, just, uh, you know, just more just uh, take it for what it's worth, uh, urging, you know, and a report, I think is, I think it's an important thing that we are doing. I think it's only gonna get more important. And it definitely makes the rack relevant. But I'll let Lucas uh, talk about that at the next meeting. Um, so move on to announcements, new business, agenda planning. Um, so we had presentations last month about wayfinding and bus improvements. So I just wanted to throw it out to the group. Uh, what does the RAC think about um, coming up with recommendations at our December meeting, uh, part for particularly the wayfinding part of it? I know, um, I think that one seemed a little bit more kind of put together where we can kind of have an impact of making recommendations. So what I propose is that Let's all uh, review the presentations 
um, you know, we have a free moment throughout this month, talk to writers uh, that we encounter, people we know in our networks and plan on discussing recommendations for wayfinding in December. And, um, you know, I, John, if I'm just make a note, because I forget that's something, his hands up. Um, so, and does, and I guess one thing, sometimes it helps to have a leader of things. Um, does anybody want to take the lead? And you know, it's okay if you don't want to, but does anyone want to take the lead on the Wayfinder um, recommendation, someone that can kind of lead the discussion? I, say, I can do it. Volunteer. I okay. like wayfinding, and I'm and I go to that L'Enfant, which is where they're doing their pilots. So I think it'll be a, a decently, relatively easier lift than some other things. Thank you. And I remember you had a good um, you, you had some good insight regarding I think it was the Tokyo, um, I I think kind of a scenario model that they were kind of uh, proposing. But yeah, um, I, I've, I, I have a lot that. of yeah, I've been on a lot of different systems around the world and love to talk about all the things they do well. I think nothing in my experience will ever top the Tokyo subway, you know, experience, but that's just... I don't know. Moscow trains every two minutes. Gotta love that. Yeah, true. Um, okay, John. No, I, I just wanted to add on, and, and, and Dina said it, um, you know, we are doing the pilot at LaFont. Um, if anybody, you know, if anybody does want to come down physically and take a look at stuff, um, please let me know. I'd be happy to, you know, I'm our headquarters obviously is is right above LaFont. Um, you know, I'd be happy to meet you or even off hours um, to go walk around or even, you know, if we can get if we get multiple people um, that want to do this and can sort of find a mutually agreeable time, I might able be able to get the project staff, um, you know, to do a little a little show and tell. Um, I know that some elements of the pilot are sort of still they're still working through installing them and all that. But again, if anybody is interested in in seeing it live and in person, please please do let me know. Yeah, I definitely like to set that up. Okay. Are you there five days a week? Uh, I am uh, usually three Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but I, I have an easy commute in. So oh, that's a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is my no, so I'm also, you know, I'm also happy to come in uh, understanding that, you know, everybody else has day jobs as well that aren't Metro. Um, you know, I'm happy to come in at other times as well if that works better for folks or, or do it after work. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'm across the street and have the same days. So okay. I think we can make that part at least. Yeah. I'm going to be making the recommend the recommendations. I definitely need the tour. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you, Dina. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Is there... Um, we're, we're in the new business part. Does anybody have any new business they want to bring up to the committee? We have uh, 12 minutes, so we're good. Seeing nothing, then I just want to say thank you for in advance for all the work you've been doing in the future, for being on this. Um, this has been a productive meeting. Um, I really appreciate everybody. And I, I move that we adjourn the meeting. Oh, Second. John. John, go ahead. Sorry, just in case, because Dina, I thought you were going to say, like, does anybody have any initial budget feedback or, or no? I don't want to force the issue, but. I mean, the feedback, my feedback is that any of those service cuts, like in the center, like central in the district are going to be catastrophic. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just to say right now, those service cuts, the particularly uh, the, the, the final scenario of that, um, commuting from Virginia, where we already have longer, longer wait times, um, I'm out. I mean, I, I am not taking the train. It's just, uh, it's, I can't do it. Um, it'll, it just doesn't, it's not conducive to people, you know, anybody, but, you know, at least from my perspective, children making it to, um, you know, like whether it's like people picking their children up from daycare um, or, uh, you know, activities, sports, anything like that. It's just not, it's not conducive to, um, any human working adult um, or commuting adult. So I'm out. Um, and that's pretty, probably what I'll be saying <laughs> in my little 10 seconds of that. So um, anybody else want to respond to John? OK, and I heard a, a second for the adjournment. So I moved. I say that this uh, RAC meeting is adjourned. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Have a good night.